Hello, guys. Nice to have you on the show. This is going to be an experience for all of us because Nick and Celosia, you've never been a guest on a podcast before, and I've never had two people <laughs> on at the same time before. So. <laughs> and we've Massive never been learning. interviewed together either. Yeah, well, so, there you go. So there's yeah. all sorts of new first cool. all around. Yeah, yeah. Um, thankfully, uh, all of us have very different sounding voices because anyone listening, I, I personally hate it when there's more than two people on a podcast. And if two of them sound even vaguely alike, I completely lose track of what's going on. So what you're saying is I shouldn't t- be talking like this then. I shouldn't be raising my voice at all. If that's your attempt at an Irish accent. Oh, it's awful. Very <laughs> uh, I don't even try. Don't worry. No, I could no. go straight into me. I could go straight into me lucky charms if you like. <laughs> that's not even a real accent. I know. Let's get actually started. Um, so um, who would like to go first? Who wants to do round one, Nick or Celosia? Her. He's going to his... put me up first, huh? Throw yeah, me yeah, under the bus. You first. <laughs> So, Salosia, why don't you get us started and tell me a little bit about your childhood, where you grew up, um, siblings, all that kind of a thing. Uh, I grew, well, I was born in the Chicago area, um, northeastern Illinois, um, and we lived in the suburbs till I was about eight. Um, actually had some really cool opportunities while we were there. My whole family volunteered at an 1890s living history farm. Um, So you dress like in period and cook like they did everything. Um, So I have a lot of very fun memories of that from when I was a child. And then when I was eight, uh, my father went through, I guess, his midlife crisis and bought a farm. (laughs) (laughs) So we moved to uh, South Central Wisconsin. And his original dream was to be able to do all of the farming with horse-drawn implements, um, like we did at the Living History Farm. Okay, so, so he not yeah. only decided to completely change lifestyle, he decided to com- become a complete Luddite and just go right back. Just about, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Basically Amish. <laughs> yeah. Um, that lasted six to eight months, and then he had to go back to work to feed his five children. <laughs> so we, we lived on the farm for 20 years, um, rented off most of the arable land to a neighbor who farmed it for us, essentially. Um, had horses, sheep couple of cows every once in a while that we would raise for the meat and uh, so I kind of grew up a little feral you know just running around playing on you know playing Mary Poppins in the barn jumping into a loose pile of hay kind of stuff yeah (laughs) yeah I've had that experience too yeah Yeah, it's fun it's a lot of fun we had sleepovers in the barn too that was actually a little creepy sometimes (laughs) wouldn't be able to do that in Ireland with the temperatures but we always wanted to (laughs) yeah the temperature (laughs) the temperature where she grew up is actually colder actually yeah wisconsin is colder. <laughs> yeah. yeah but you also get it it's like it gets very cold but it also gets very hot in the summer isn't it yeah yeah and yeah, very yeah, humid yeah. we we never get the heat like <laughs> a hot day in ireland is like 19 degrees celsius uh, so that, i don't know the conversion just if america could just second, catch up and use the metric it. system like everybody else everything would be easy um so but anyway sorry about, it's about 65 70 oh so perfect yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's about perfect temperature <laughs> yeah yeah it is it is but that's like hot here yeah um so like what what about school when you when you moved from the suburbs to a farm uh you obviously moved schools i'm sure but yeah um, oh yeah because it was probably almost about a two hour we moved two hours away from where we used to live and so we went from you know a school in a suburb to a very small <laughs> k through 12 school in my town which when I left was 1140 people so yeah it was quite a culture shift and a culture shock um can I just ask you you said something I I don't fully understand when you say k through 12 I know k is kindergarten yes um was it the one school that does like elementary middle and high school in the one building um, yes, in larger towns, they'll split those. So yeah. like you'll go to elementary school to either middle school or junior high and then high school. So uh-huh. this, um, because it was such a small town, it was literally one building and there were different sections of the building for each of the different kind of age groups. Age groups. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, no, because yeah. I, I knew about the, the three levels, but yeah. I never knew it could be done in the one building. So that's cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> In larger my, towns here and cities, yeah. they funnel. Yeah. So there'll be a ton of elementary schools, fewer middle schools, and then one or two high schools. 
yeah. yeah it's more or less the same here but we just have two levels so we'd have primary school which is where i work which would be ages four to 13 okay. and then um uh, secondary school which is just 13 to 18 19 um, okay. but the same like the all secondary schools would be bigger than like there'd be four or five primary schools for one mm -hmm. secondary yeah. yeah yeah so pretty similar just <clears throat> they seem to separate that middle group as well yeah yeah exactly yeah and um so then when you're growing up like and you had that big change um what what was the hardest bit to go from because like an American suburb is essentially an Irish city. Let's let's call it yeah. state, all right. Um, yes. So like to go from a, a a very urban childhood to suddenly very rural. Um, yeah. Was there any culture shocks for you that kind of stuck with you? Um, uh, I'm not super sure. I kind of was off in my own world anyway already at that point. <laughs> um, I I struggled with fitting into the culture of the small town. Um. I went through periods where I got bullied pretty heavily uh, mm. to the point that for the last two years of middle school, I was actually homeschooled um, mm. because it had gotten that bad in sixth grade. Um, so that actually was really good for me because I was able to kind of learn more at my own pace. And my mom worked in my love of reading to get me interested into other subjects. Math, I still really struggled with because math. <laughs> <laughs> numbers but yeah I'm not good at them <laughs> but um so that was it was definitely interesting I think I was a lot more openly artistic I guess would mm -hmm. be an easy way to phrase it than a lot of the kids that grew up in that culture and in that environment I think partly just because of the culture that was in place um you know family farms we lived there for over 20 years and we're still considered outsiders yeah. Um, so like it was a very kind of closed community where if your family hadn't lived there for years and years and years, um, you were the blow ins. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> so I like I, I loved the... being on the farm, but yeah. the community was severely lacking. <laughs> OK. Um, so you mentioned your love of reading. Uh, mm -hmm. and your mother working that into your homeschool and so what were the big reading loves of your childhood oh I could probably give you about a book a, a year <laughs> kind of where the big ones you do know, you I have a have... week <laughs> no it might take a week that's um, the, here's the other thing I'm also as we're as we're talking I'm also like settling in I'm like oh I, I have Nick as well to go through oh god <laughs> <laughs> so like, let's keep it moving guys <laughs> um I remember okay third grade the big book we read in class was uh, James and the Giant Peach oh uh, yeah which yeah. uh I was in what they call a split classroom for third grade so half of the class was third half the class was fourth Okay, and they yeah. had a student teacher who would kind of alternate teaching the different groups. And so they were reading a different book, which was called From the Mixed Up Files of Mrs. Basil E. Frankweiler. And it was about these two kids who ran away and lived in the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art, which way cooler. I had yeah. already read James and the Giant Peach at this point, you know. Um, so he let me, he's like, well, if you finish it, then I'll let you read this other book so that you'll pay attention in class. <laughs> And I finished James and the Giant Peach in one night and nobody believed me in classics. <laughs> I think my teacher did, but um, in fourth grade, our teacher read us um, The Rats of Nim. And then, Love yeah. That book. And Love. then during that time period, my school had a 15 minute break during the day where you could read on your own, which was like yeah. my favorite time of the day. And that year I worked my way through Black Beauty, like only reading it during that time. And then in fifth grade, I really went into the horse world. <laughs> I don't remember titles really, um, but I do remember the book we read as a class was The Hatchet, which is about a kid in a small plane who it goes down in the Canadian wilderness and the pilot dies and he basically survives with only a hatchet as the only tool he has. Okay. Yeah. And then sixth grade, we dived into Greek mythology. And yeah, yeah. There, you <laughs> and I got in trouble. Varied, for... <laughs> like from a teacher's point of view, that that's a really like the, the reading list kind of yo-yos over and back doing so many different oh, yeah. themes and everything. Yeah, yeah, it's broad spectrum. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Which is good. Don't get me like yeah. it, it's 
grade, you know? Yeah, um, and in sixth grade, we did the Holocaust kind of woven in books and- Okay. Yeah. And, the, and then- And I got in trouble of... for reading during study hall <laughs> <laughs> instead of doing my homework. Really? You got in trouble for reading? Yeah. Oh, wait, hang on. It says me. I, I give out to kids for reading all the time. What am I saying? <laughs> <laughs> no, to, to, to defend myself, when they're supposed to be listening to maths or when I, when, when we're doing PE or when they're walking down the stairs, you know, that's when I get <laughs> Which you laugh, but yes, happens all the time. Oh, I've done it. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. So have I. <laughs> no, this was during we had like a period where you could work on your schoolwork called study hall. Oh. And I was reading Little Women and it was a misuse of my time. All right, we're not. We're, we're, we're not. <laughs> if I didn't have another person on the podcast, I would now delve into that, and that would be the main topic of the entire show. But I'm go, I'm going to be nice to Nick. <laughs> um, so Nick, we'll move on over to you now. What about you? Uh, how similar or different was yours and uh, Slosia's childhood? Um, remarkably different. <laughs> I grew Good, up because it was in... the exact same. It wouldn't be a very interesting interview. <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. I grew up uh, in just outside of Buffalo, New York, a town called the Town of Evans. That's the official name. It's not Evans. It's the Town of Evans. Oh, I have no that's... idea why. Wow. Okay. But uh, I, um, I just lost my prompt. Damn me. That's okay. So the town of Evans is where you grew yeah. up. And what, what was your um, what was your family situation like? like uh, were you rural? Were you urba, urban? We were, were, we suburban? were suburban. Uh, the term that was used was a commuter town. A commuter town. Okay. Yeah. Meaning most people worked in the city of Buffalo, but a lot of people, you know, people don't want to live in the city. So it's that kind of town. It's like a suburb, but independent. Yeah. Independent yeah. government. Uh I grew up with both of my parents. My father worked in construction. Uh, his father worked in construction. All my uncles worked in construction. Um, my mom was a classically trained pianist with oh. three college degrees. <laughs> and she wasn't a professional pianist. She actually was a teacher uh, oh. before I was born and then became a member of the town government later on and got a law degree when I was in middle school. So education was a big thing in my house. Yeah. Um, and I'd say in the same time, because of your father's side of the family, <clears throat> like hard work and rolling up your sleeves was probably very important. Yeah, well. yeah, exactly. Um, we did a lot of like, when it was time to put a new deck on the house, we put the new deck on the house. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's me out there at 10 years old with a post hole digger. <laughs> that's taller than i am um that kind of yeah we did a lot of that kind of stuff and you know learned a lot of the important things like don't stick your hand in the saw you know important stuff like that um <clears throat> but i went to a more traditionally american school system than Solosia did uh elementary actually we had an intermediate school because we had more students than our middle school could hold Oh. So we had kindergarten through fourth grade okay. and then fifth and sixth were in a separate building. Oh, and okay. then we had a middle school, which was seventh, eighth and ninth. And then the senior high school was 10th, 11th and 12th grade. And, and not, not to go too much into the American education system again, but <laughs> um, what grade would you normally do middle school? Like what grades are they? Uh, middle school would be, what would that be fifth, sixth, seventh? Yeah. Fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth? Or sixth, seventh, eighth. Or sixth, oh. seventh, eighth. Yeah. Um, but because we had yeah. more students than the middle school could hold, they actually took the old high school and turned it into the intermediate school. So it, it, you don't, yeah, don't. It's just build a new school. <clears throat> like, I know. <laughs> well, you know, it's right there. <laughs> Oh, God. And uh, what were your favorite subjects in school then? Oh, uh, art, music and English. <laughs> I'm pretty easy, pretty easy to uh, pin down with that one. Mm. I enjoyed sciences. I never really got the hang of math. I'm capable of it, but it didn't hold my interest well enough for me to stick with it, mm. really. Uh, 
which is very interesting because my best friend is a physicist. So we have a lot of very interesting math conversations that I don't understand <laughs> at, at all. Um, but yeah, my, uh, let's see here. I, the last math I took was in the ninth grade. That was the last time I took a math course. Ninth grade. So that'd be, uh, wait, really? Thir 13, 14 years old. Yeah. Wow. That was the okay. last math I took. In Ireland, maths, because first of all, it's maths. The maths. Best, the yes. Um, uh, maths is mandatory until you're 19. See, Ireland. my class was the last one in New York State that it wasn't mandatory all the oh, way so through. Like math so, all the way through. Uh, yeah. Okay. So now it is. I didn't go beyond <clears throat> algebra and geometry. Yep. Uh, the last, my last year of high school, I took five English classes, an art class, uh, phys ed, PE, and chorus. Are your subjects? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and I also taught, uh, the 11th grade English class. Of, of course, of course you did. Now, <laughs> now, now, I was going to compare and be like, well, here's the subjects I did in my leaving search, which is your last year in school in Ireland. Mm -hmm. But no, no, please explain <laughs> why a child is teaching children English. Um, mainly because the teacher didn't understand Beowulf. Oh, okay. And she asked me <laughs> to teach it. So I taught a semester wow, uh, okay. for her. Because she was doing old English liver, literature. Hmm. Could you mute? Please? I'm going to start stuttering because I'm hearing that <laughs> echo of myself from the mics. Um, no, she didn't understand Beowulf. And I could, I had a fair ability to read old English at that point. Okay. So Anglo-Saxon. And yeah, I know. Just leave me alone about it. I'm that I'm that kind of nerd. Oh, no, no, no. no. It's all right. It, I, I knew you were that kind of nerd when you said you taught a class. So yeah, it's fine. And it was Beowulf. <laughs> but no, she want, she was going through. Uh, she was she taught the honors English class, which is like the high level English for mm. each grade level. And she was teaching a early English literature she taught an early English literature section and I wasn't even in honors English because oh. I didn't feel like taking the test Oh, because he had to test in and I just didn't feel like it. I was that lazy. Um, but she knew I understood it because she and I had actually become friends during my 11th grade year. Hmm. And so she asked me to teach it for her. And I taught a full semester of early English literature, Piers Plowman and Beowulf and uh, geez, there were more, but Oh. Canterbury, Tales? Canterbury Tales was in there yeah yeah don't teach high school kids the Canterbury Tales holy cow or they, or even better don't teach high school kids yeah. <laughs> I mean I, I don't. learned that lesson later on in life um <laughs> but so yeah and then I went off to college for eight years hey okay. and still um, managed to never take a math <laughs> that yeah that that just seems so bizarre but to it's, me but the, i can't i can't believe they let me get away with it honestly yeah like yeah. they it, that shouldn't have happened no um so for for both of you because I, I didn't ask you this question uh, so i'm gonna ask you both now um when like looking back and thinking of your school years and your early childhood and your family and all that kind of a thing at any point did you know I want to be a storyteller? I want to be someone who creates stories, or is that something you just kind of fell naturally into? Slosia is being pointed. Well, I was going to say, I'm going to pull something down from my bookshelf. You're going to pull everything down from your bookshelf. Oh, I did not expect that to happen. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> I was going to pull down. Two viewpoints this almost. isn't mine. Oh, you see wow. the name on that? Life's tough in outer space. Yep. By... Oh, I didn't. Nicholas it. Sullivan. There you go. I wrote that book in kindergarten. Oh, <laughs> I was six. So he's got the jump on me. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a I... good book. <laughs> I just read it recently. <laughs> All righty then. I'm just glad that the picture frame didn't fall down. I'm glad the shelf didn't fall down. I put that up. Do it. 
for, so um i know we didn't do a health and safety bit at the start before we record <laughs> but i'm gonna start doing a health and safety bit at the start from now on <laughs> we've been off the rails since we started recording you know that right we were off the rails before we started recording <laughs> let's call a spade a spade oh goodness <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Nick obviously the had the Nick obviously had the storytelling um, uh, gene early. Did did mm-hmm. did it, when did it arrive for you, Sadosia? Huh. I physically started to write about seventh grade, um, but my mom would tell you that I've always been a storyteller. Oh. Um, in seventh grade, so this was during my homeschool time period. Hmm. She had an old Macintosh computer. Oh. that she used because she was a freelance editor for the local paper oh. and she had me write a report one day and I sat down the next day and wrote a 10-page story okay terrible, just like that. Sure. <laughs> but yeah like I was the one who couldn't write a paragraph before this there was a block mm-hmm. and the computer unlocked it that's funny because and I blame <clears throat> Microsoft Word for my grammar <laughs> I blame well, Microsoft as as someone to blame. for everything. <laughs> well, you're not going to blame your mom, who was your homeschool teacher for a while. So, like, you may as well blame the technology. <laughs> well, I, I got irritated with the green and red little squiggly lines. Yeah, yeah. I just turned I didn't them know off. you can turn them off. Yeah, I didn't know. Um, she got lucky. She got to learn to type on a type on a computer. So you I learned, learned on a on a 1946 royal quiet deluxe so a typewriter uh, yeah <laughs> you could have just said typewriter <laughs> in fact it's in here somewhere oh wow i was gonna okay. say mine uh, is under my desk for the Mine's for the purposes of your health and safety um we, i'm not touching <laughs> not pick up things again <laughs> the thing weighs about 30 pounds i'm not picking that no. up <laughs> um but I'll do this for anybody watching or listening. I'll edit, I'll get uh, Nick or Slosia to send me a picture of it and I'll put it in. And for anyone listening, yeah. it'll be on the blog post on the website as well. So it'll be, everything's all there ready for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like magic. Jazz hands. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, someone would said to me, was like, how do you, how do you have everything ready and all that? I'm like, oh, cause I say it in the interview and then I'm writing as I'm going, like all the jobs yeah. I have to give myself. Making notes. Uh, make it look like smart. you're smart by just <laughs> doing it on the spot and then preemptively putting it all together. One so, of my mom's favorite phrases was if you make a mistake, make it look like you did it on purpose. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> whenever uh, for the first couple of years of teaching whenever i had to write out um this is before i had a projector in the room and a laptop i whenever i had to write out something that i wanted the kids to write down i would always say at the end and by the way there's three mistakes there on the board and if you can find them you get a prize <laughs> i never put mistakes in it was just so that if they found a mistake i'm like well done where's the other two you know <laughs> smart it's very smart very gaslighty too actually when i think back anyway um so we've we've kind of talked about your kind of early lives i'd love to know the story of where or how you guys uh met whoever wants me to take this one you take it okay uh can you mute Mm -hmm. Uh, i have that weird thing where if i hear my voice that did not mute hang on Okay, now it muted. I said to myself, I'll edit out all the times that Nick says, can you mute? And at this stage, I've lost track, so I'm not going to. But anyway. There's five or six at least. Um, <laughs> but so I, you- okay, yeah, that's where we were going. We have a mutual friend, Todd, who is Solosia's editor and has been, and is an author and has been a friend of mine for several years. And Todd was getting married in Galveston, Texas, which is right down on the Gulf, Gulf of Mexico. Okay. okay. And <clears throat> I was living up here in Colorado. Solosia was living uh, in Illinois at that point. And we were both invited to the wedding. And I was supposed to be bringing a date. And my date ghosted me about a month before the wedding. Okay just completely stopped talking to me and so I went solo and the night I got there 
I texted Todd and said, Hey, what's everybody doing? Cause it's a destination wedding. You figure people are going to meet up and hang yeah. out the night before. And Todd was like, well, we don't have any plans, but I've got a couple of friends who are in town and they wanted to walk around the city. Cause there was a, a festival Dickens on the strand, which is a Victorian Christmas festival that they do down there in the historic part of the city on the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll get to that part in a minute. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Because I was in, I had full Victorian dress. I was in a three-piece wool Victorian suit the entire time I was there. With a top hat, gloves. I had big goatee. I had it uh, waxed oh, and curled. God. Yeah. And so that night, <clears throat> Todd was like, yeah, I've got these two friends who want to, you know, walk around the historic part of the city, but they don't have anybody to go with them. I was mm -hmm. like, I'll go with them. Have them meet me. Because my hotel was right in the middle of where the festival was. I was like, you know have them meet me. You know, this is what I look like. And I took a picture, not that Todd wouldn't know, but they wouldn't know so that, yeah. you know, they could actually know what I looked like. And I escorted them around the city that night. And we ended up having to go back to my hotel because I was in 15 pounds of wool in 80 degree temperatures. Yeah. Like full long coat, like God. proper Victorian suit. So I need to stop you, Nick, and I need to go to Celosia and be like, what were you thinking when you meet this man? <laughs> <laughs> like with the, the handlebar mustache, goatee, like gloves in, well, in then, knee, which I know yeah. is hot, but I don't know how hot it is in real temperature. Um, um, we'll see. It, it's fine. I know it's We'll hot. figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> so I knew going in that it was this festival was going on and they were encouraging people to dress if they were comfortable in costume for it for mm. the wedding. Because the wedding itself was a steampunk pirate airship theme. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah. yeah. So I, I wasn't in costume the night we met, but uh, the picture we have that we took together the next day at the reception, I was in full corset bustle pirate look. <laughs> yeah, pirate hat. Yeah. Big purple wig. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> and that's 26.7 C. Okay, yeah, that's hot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the next day, in the same outfit, it was... Hold on. He's doing I have this. an app. You see, if... if it was 32 C. Okay, yeah, that's... that's yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My mustache melted. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure the rest of you did as well. <laughs> I was hung over. So oh, well, then you were I was melting anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we met at the we met the night before. She missed the actual wedding because she was helping everybody else get dressed because she knows how to oh. fit a corset. And none, nobody, none of the other women in the wedding party did. So she didn't get a chance to go get changed. By the time she got changed and came back, the wedding was over. Oh, man. And so we ended up sitting next to each other at the reception, walking around this uh, Victorian city mansion. I'm not sure if there's a proper term for that. Uh, that looking at the crown home. molding. We were like 1840s, right on the Gulf, floor to ceiling <clears throat> windows. Wow. Yeah. And we walked around uh, admiring the sconces and the crown molding and like just looking at the house, you know, everybody's on the dance floor having fun. And we're like, that is really good scroll work up there. I wonder if that's original. Like, <laughs> so we hit it off basically. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah, you, you, <laughs> like, I mean, if you find someone that admires something as mundane, but also interesting as molds on ceilings. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think don't let that person get away from you. Yeah. Because uh, <laughs> you're few and far between. And so were you both at this point before just before you met or when you met were you both writing uh for a hobby or are you writing at this point as a career or trying to make it a career maybe published um yeah, yeah. so i had had um rogues and wildfire and winter Wednesday had been published at that point oh okay and i had published all four of my novels at that point so okay. yeah. I was my first novel came out in 2012. Oh, so, okay. So yeah, things things. Yeah, are I was great. Yeah, that's actually how I met Todd. Was we have a mutual friend, and we used to do conventions together. Okay. So we would like watch each other's tables and stuff like that. 
and that's how Todd and I became friends. And so I see I met Todd through, uh, you're muted. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to keep it from echoing too much. I know. I, know. <laughs> uh, I met Todd through an online writing program that I joined a six month intensive. Oh, okay. um, so we met through there and then Todd also met his business partner through there and they started the press that I've been published through. Oh, okay. All right. So it was just all like, inter- yeah, just <laughs> interwoven. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> oh, that's really good. So, but, so you both kind of knew each other's, um, you didn't know each other, but you knew each other's kind of uh, way of life and lifestyle in terms of yeah. like, you're both writers and published mm-hmm. and conventions and all that kind of stuff which i kind of forgot what cons even are at this point i know been so- <laughs> i know but uh i have yet to do a convention as an author we're hoping to start doing that next year i think same but i also feel like uh, ireland doesn't have as many conventions like that and if we do they're usually very small um so the small I, ones I, can be the most fun though true, 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 true. It's you're not, there's not that ones. press of humanity yeah 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 that's very true so um what is it for both of you about writing that you enjoy the most don't all answer at once <laughs> i think we were both waiting for the other one to start talking. yeah yeah you so those you answered the last one first so you find it you go oh, okay okay your okay. turn <laughs> well i come from a background like my family always sat around and told stories hmm. like you go to grandma's house or you you know family reunions everybody ends up in the kitchen telling stories about when dad or when mom was growing up and you know so there's kind of a history kind of a tradition of storytelling in my family and I just I love kind of creating worlds and playing parts and you know growing up a voracious reader I, the idea of being able to do that myself and kind of writing stories I would want to read and telling stories I would want to hear, like it's kind of an honor to be able to do it. Yeah. And uh, I was, we were talking about this the other day, actually, that the way I look at it, we are a part of a tradition that goes back to the cave paintings. Mm. and that's you know a big part of how I look at it is I get to be a part of that you know tradition going back tens of thousands of years an unbroken string all the all the way leading to the three of us all the way leading you know? to the three of us on a podcast um <laughs> like <laughs> knocking things almost off shelves. opposite sides of the globe uh yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I know and, what you mean, though. It, it's, it's, I suppose I never thought of it like that. Like, that was the whole point of, well, we, we were pretty sure that was the whole point of the cave paintings. Like, it could have been. Yeah, yeah that, that they, they were, were illustrations in a spoken word book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, early so, YouTube. Early YouTube. Early That's YouTube. Yeah, actually, <laughs> you say that. Uh, this is funny. I had made a note to say this to you afterwards, uh, but seeing as it's relevant now, I'll say it. I was watching, uh, I think I saw it on TikTok, um, but it was a short video. No, it wasn't TikTok because it was longer than a minute. And it was, uh, somebody had discovered why. So a lot of cave paintings, when you look at them, um, animals might have five legs. I think I know what heads. you're talking about. Do you? But yeah. Yeah, a, yeah. Go on, finish, finish the thought though. Yeah. Because it's, it's unreal. And um, for ages, people didn't know, like they just thought, did someone paint over it or... Like, is there a particular reason or whatever? And some guy or some woman or somebody twigged, well, hang on, like, we're so deep in the cave system that it's pitch black without lights. So they had to have lights. So the fire, when because that was the only way yep. they would have had light, when the fire is there, it's not a still light. It flickers and it moves and it shifts. And what ends up happening was that it makes the, uh, yeah, it, it's, it makes the, uh, painting flicker and move a bit so mm-hmm. that it kind of looks like it's moving like and it's animated yeah, yeah basically yeah. yeah and they actually did that they turned off all the lights and they lit fires and they were like oh my god and it just it came it just to shows life how intelligent 
cave people yeah. or the stone age people were because i think there's this stereotype of um that the, like we are physiologically no different from the people that did those paintings like, at all yeah. no at all and there was people who were alive then that were much more intelligent than the three of us combined oh possibly. definitely so it's just so interesting to be like of course they had these things of course they figured out these kind of things you know and uh just makes me love the stone age people so much more <laughs> and when like i i one of my majors in college was archaeology and oh. so you're right in my wheelhouse with that <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. uh just... but one of the things that kind of always blows my mind and people talk about it with food. Like who was the first person who thought it was a good idea to suck on a cow's teat? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And, but if you think about like the bronze age that had to come from somewhere, which means some dude or some lady or some person, I should say, figured out that if I bang this rock with this harder rock and beat it into powder and then get it really, really hot, it turns into something useful. How many different rocks did they try before they found yeah, copper yeah, yeah, yeah. and then tin and then thought, hey, if I put them together, it might be better. Yeah. They were yeah. metallurgists. They were experimenting. Yeah. And it's just, it's so crazy to me. Some, and I bet that guy or that person had everybody around them telling them they were an idiot and wasting their time. <laughs> because <laughs> they're just banging on a rock with another rock yeah and then i'm sure all of us have had people tell us that we're we are foolish for pursuing podcasting oh, and pursuing yeah. writing and stuff like that and i'm not saying we're as intelligent as uh, stone age people but you know we, we, it's the same kind of a thing of you're experimenting and you're trying to make something work and eventually it will you know um hopefully so, so Solosia, <laughs> what about you and your um your love of writing like what is the, the part of it that you love the most um, I think pretty similar you know the the ability to create worlds and um I'm a big fantasy nut always have been um and so for me especially in the hardest times in middle school you know escaping into a story was one of the ways that I kind of survived and so being able to take that and to create these intricate worlds and systems. And um, I'm in the process of editing my first full length fantasy novel and, you know, creating all of that. It's just, you get to explore and kind of take a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And, you know, I have another project where I'm combining Greek underworld mythology with Victorian society, just because why not? Yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah, it sounded like fun. <laughs> <laughs> They're both things that interest me. So I'm going to put them together and see what happens. Awesome. Um, so, yeah. Well, I mean, a lot that's, of... we're both at a steampunk themed wedding. I mean, that's essentially what someone did. They took, you know, yeah. clockwork and steam engines and all that and the Victorian kind of aesthetic and put them together. And now it's a whole genre on its own. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, so you both are multi podcasters, if that makes sense. Uh, you have so many um just to <laughs> name them to be sure that i took my notes properly uh, um nick you have uh, brimstone and you have old bob yep uh Celosia, you have bedtime stories with Celosia crane yep. uh you also then have punks in the library which is your podcast that you do together and i know you're both working on another podcast each so here's me thinking i'm great because i run my podcast <laughs> all by myself and here's you two guys coming along with like give me the metaphorical podcaster middle finger uh so <laughs> i love how you're both talking you're both on mute this time oh. <laughs> <laughs> don't look at it that way think about it this way you have a full-time job True. i don't this is True. my full-time job that is so point. you know i have <clears throat> and i work generally i work 16 hour days doing this yeah so you know, there's no looking down on anybody who's just doing one. You're probably way smarter than me for just doing one. <laughs> I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> so I know that, uh, like, because they're very different. So just just so I can give um, the, the audience an understanding. Uh, Brim, Brimstone and Old Bob, Nick's two podcasts, are both, um, uh, they're essentially a radio play, but they're not. Yeah, radio it's, dramas. It's like radio yeah. dramas, but, um, you know, in... in, in that's basically what they are and then yeah. bedtime stories 
I mean, I don't think I need to explain what bedtime stories <laughs> is because you very cleverly put it in the title. Um, <laughs> but then, so could you f- explain to me first, uh, punks in the library? Um, because I, 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 I know how it started. But I'd love to get your. I'd love for the listeners to know. Uh, punks in the library basically came out of the idea of people calling me an idiot, <laughs> ultimately. And I, growing up, I played in punk bands. I was, you know, my mother was a classical pianist. She insisted we all weren't, weren't an instrument. And I ended up playing guitar and I ended up playing in punk bands throughout high school and, you know, 15 to about 22 in that range. And so I kind of developed a very DIY attitude toward things, you know, very much, you know, there are no rules. There are only guidelines kind of mentality. And then I got more seriously into the writing world, the world of authors and I had already been writing for a long time and I started being told you can't do it that way. You have to do this. You have to have these elements. You have to do these things. And uh, it came to a head actually before Nickel City came out, you know, so we're talking 2008, 2009. It came to a head when I got a traditional publishing contract and for Nickel City originally uh and they told me that i needed to include a romance subplot in my story about an immortal noir detective (laughs) i had to have a romance subplot and i told them no and they said well good luck getting this published anywhere else we have right of first refusal okay so i burned the manuscript (laughs) i wouldn't let them have it and that kind of like set me on the path to just saying, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it my way, whether I fail or succeed. Mm. And after Celosia and I met, I kind of, you know, I didn't bring her in on that, but I kind of realized that she had that same kind of thing where we had been told for so long how to do it and that there is only a right way. Quick and question, yep. just to get a time, a sense of the time, when did you actually meet? Um uh 2018 okay okay. yeah the first weekend of december in 2018 (laughs) so end end of 2018 (laughs) and just there Mm -hmm. you both answered a question i wasn't going to ask which was who's the one who remembers the anniversary because in every couple there's only one who remembers the anniversary and the other we we both do oh you both do do. okay i'm just bad with the years okay (laughs) i knew the month (laughs) he did uh if we forget we just have to remember todd's anniversary (laughs) I, yeah, true. yeah. <laughs> we met the day before yep <laughs> uh so when when Celosi and I met and kind, kind of realized that we both had this understanding getting back to the question that we didn't want to be told how to create mm. and I just got this image in my head of being a literal punk in a library you're surrounded by all these studious looking people and you walk in a leather jacket with a mohawk and beat up old doc martens on and you're going to stand out a little bit Mm. it doesn't mean it's wrong to do things your own way and i thought well why don't we start a podcast where we talk about doing what we do from like street level from you know not college professors and literary theorists and you know writing coaches we are not that we are people who have taken the hard knocks yeah and we want to tell you what that's like how we do what we do and how you can do what you want to do and kind of inspire people to tell the story they want to tell in the way they want to tell it is usually the way i phrase it Okay. And so, you know, the idea of being a punk in a library, which I usually am about once a week, I spend, a, we spend a decent amount of time in libraries and she was like, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that. Absolutely. And we started the podcast and we've been obnoxiously inconsistent with it before now. 
Well, <sighs> I mean, you know, if, if you're going to do anything punk, why why would you <laughs> why? stay to a particular schedule? I mean, <laughs> like, so, so Lucia, <laughs> what has uh, what has punks in the library been like for you? Like now, like like looking back, I don't want to say looking back like as if it's done, but you know, <laughs> I mean, you've been doing it for a while. So looking back, how has like I'm sure you're proud of it. If you weren't proud of it, you wouldn't still be doing it. But what is it about it that makes you keep wanting to do new episodes? The open conversation of kind of the different topics that come up, you know, we both come to them from slightly different perspectives, um, different experiences for sure. Um, and just having an excuse to talk about literary stuff is fun. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if it's so, not fun, what's the point? <laughs> right? Yeah. And, you know, getting to have an excuse to sit down and have these types of conversations as a couple, but also as authors who come from their own perspectives and are wanting to share that perspective with other people, mm. um, I think has been good for our relationship, I hope. <laughs> yeah, it hasn't hurt it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I assume it hasn't. Like, if you can work yeah. together, I'm pretty sure you can stay together. <laughs> I hope so. We're doing so, all right so far. Was Punks in the Library the first podcast in your wheelhouse? Yeah, it was my first time into the um, podcasting for Ray. Um, he kind of planted the idea of me having my own. And then after like a month, maybe, I was like, yeah, I think I want to do this. And it was also during the height of the pandemic. Mm. And, you know, my family is in the Midwest and East Coast. And I have pretty young nieces and nephews. And so when I started Bedtime Stories, it was like, well, I can't really be physically a part of their lives right now because of distance and travel restrictions, but <laughs> I can still read them stories. Um, and it's been really kind of cool to see where it's gone from that. We have a mutual friend. Um, who is a veteran uh, with PTSD, and he finds listening to it very soothing wow. and helping him kind of wind down from those episodes. And so like knowing that I've somehow found an audience, <laughs> it may not have been the one I originally intended, but people really seem to be enjoying, um, you know, listening to folk tales and fairy tales and fables and it's been really kind of cool that that is really cool and I, yeah. I didn't I, I'm so glad you, you said that because I, I was gonna ask like why bedtime stories why brimstone why old mm -hmm. Bob um so that that's that's such a nice um unexpected result of uh, yeah stories. and I'm I'm a huge fan of fairy tales <clears throat> anyway I always have been um and so I already had quite the collection of books that I could draw from and um, kind of exposure to different cultures and and things as well so it's a lot of fun for me to dive into the different mythologies of different cultures and to see how different they all are it's very fascinating she did an uh, entire month on Wales, the country yeah okay <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> the country yes. i mean i, I did like, have Moby one <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I mean, I probably could read that if I wanted to, because I'm sure it's public domain at this point. I'm sure, but I don't want to. to. It has to. <laughs> um, so, and can I just to be sure? Because I, I, I listened to um, one episode of Bedtime Stories, but I didn't get to look at all. Are they all stories that uh, are any of them your own original ones, or is it just ones like from folk tales, from myth, legend? I think I have one original on there right now, um, which is called The Hound of Hecate. Uh, which takes place in that Greek mythology, Victorian melded world. Um, but beyond that, at this point, it's all been reading stories. Yeah, that's, that's such a great idea. And um, so Punks of the Library was first. So then Nick, was yeah. it you that then started up? I think Brimstone was the old one. Uh, the original one was actually N.J. Sullivan telling tales. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was telling, it was originally it was just going to be, I'm going to tell a story every now and then, you know, it's not going to be like an ongoing series. It's just going to be stories. I'm just going to write stories. And then <clears throat> it started becoming just all brimstone, but I had a sci-fi story I wanted to tell too. 
and I realized I'm probably going to have to split these two into two separate podcasts, mm. which is how I ended up with old Bob and Brimstone and the new one that's coming because I'm a lunatic. Uh, <clears throat> so Brimstone started out as an experiment. I just wanted to kind of play with the format a little bit and see what I could do with it and kind of play with the idea of like a noir detective story told in first person. Cause you know, I grew up playing music. I grew up with a mic in my face a lot of the time. <laughs> so I really enjoy kind of being able to embody a character mm. like to tell a story. Cause I also grew up listening to, and so did Solosia actually a lot of the old radio serials like the lone ranger and the phantom and the shadow and the war of the worlds which is the fa most famous one yeah and i grew up listening to those and i really enjoyed them you know a lot of late night car rides coming back from grandma's house on sunday listening to the radio and they would play old serials and so i always kind of had a love for that type of storytelling mm. and i wanted to experiment with it and brimstone started to gain a following and i was like well i've got this other story i want to tell but i don't want to mix them together yeah uh, so that's <clears throat> when i split old bob off into its own thing and just you know got rid of telling tales as a podcast and made it old bob and brimstone so i hope i answered the question i'm not sure if i did <laughs> I, i'll be honest it's 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 a conversation not a question and answer because okay. i don't actually remember what i asked the name of the <laughs> but it was really interesting so it's fine <laughs> uh it went punks in the library and then telling tales which became brimstone, brimstone. and old bob and then a, actually no you started solosia you started uh bedtime, bedtime stories before mm -hmm. the same month but before i started before i put brimstone up so before telling oh. tales went live because Brim, the first episode of Brimstone went up on Halloween, mm -hmm. oh, okay. and she had started beginning of October, to, so yeah, you did it first, trendsetter. Yeah, look <laughs> at you. <laughs> I put the idea in your head, though. Yeah, well, I'm, I, I <laughs> said that in her defense, she did say he, you know, he gave me this idea, but yeah, then she was quicker off the mark, I guess. Oh. I had been experimenting with doing live storytelling on Twitch for a while before that. Mm. And I wasn't getting any traction and I kind of came down to why am I doing this live? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, it's way easier to screw up live. I know. Uh <laughs> yeah. And, and try memorizing a 10,000 word story. Oh, I no, no, thank you. Yeah. I, I've yeah. done, I've done my time. I, I stage <laughs> actor for a while. Okay. And... So, you know, yeah, yeah yeah it makes um, a soliloquy look like the back of a you know back of a cereal box <laughs> i my my hardest part i think i ever had was i was a uh, laertes in hamlet and not as bad as hamlet obviously but you know La laertes talks <laughs> he's long-winded long he's very long-winded long yeah um, but hey hey that's it so we're, we're creeping up on, on time already and it feels like we're only really getting oh. started um but i think that's the thing i think because there was two of you there was so much more i want to do but you know i might i might just get you on another day um so i'm gonna ask my same four questions that i or yeah five four or five questions that i always ask at the end what i'll do is i'll ask the question and then both of you answer one straight after the other and then we'll get a nice lovely uh finish to this wonderful conversation yeah. speed round we're doing the speed round, speed round. <laughs> it's, it's general ignorance fingers on your buzzers yes that's good. wow uh, so, qi reference <laughs> so first question is um when uh, we've stopped recording and when we said the goodbyes and good looks and all that kind of thing what's the first thing you're both going to be doing i am probably going to go pee fair <laughs> I'm probably going to check and see if my package has been delivered yet. <laughs> is it uh, exciting or is it something dull? Uh, it's a new craft. Oh, okay. I'm going to learn how to make papers out of crepe paper or flowers, flowers. out of crepe paper. Oh. <laughs> That's still pretty cool. I thought you meant like get crepe, crepe, crepe paper and like 
mulch it down again and make new, <laughs> make new paper. I was just like, that's really cool. No. That's I mean, uh, I've done it before, but it's kind of messy. It's messy and it it's, takes a long time and it's really easy to mess up. Like yeah. in the yeah. sense of like the paper will be unusable. So um, awesome. Next one. What are <laughs> your goals, both of you, as uh, I'll say storytellers i was i had it, had it written down as what are your goals as podcasters but i'll say storytellers because you know you have short stories you have novels as well so mm-hmm. um nick went first the last time so Sedosia, what are your goals now um i mean the big goal be able to turn this into a living where i don't have to work outside the home so writing and podcasting mm-hmm. um i'd love to get into doing conventions and for us to be able to travel awesome. and mine aren't that different actually (laughs) yeah uh what i'm hoping for for the company for lantern audio works is to be able to have our own studio to be able to actually do the equivalent of movie production but for audiobooks and audio dramas you know with full production facilities with custom music all of that stuff and kind of become producers and directors in a sense. Still do our own work, but produce for other people as well. Oh, okay. So <clears throat> kind of like be a production company. So, but first comes making enough money to, you know, Survive. first comes Solosia's goal is, you know, paying the <clears throat> rent and, you know, hosting this fees. being hosting fees and this being full-time, a full-time job for both of us that's, worth the amount of time we put into it that we're making enough back on it to cover it so so that we can each have our own office so yeah because this is actually how we work <laughs> oh wow like, yeah wow. we're yeah. back to back and over in that corner your uh the audio listeners can't see this but over my left shoulder is my recording booth <laughs> the the blue is soundproofing Oh, okay. So there's big blue panels. Uh, on yeah. Them. Yeah. Okay. And that's soundproofing. Well, it's better than my audio booth, which is just the hot press. Um, we, oh, which isn't, that doesn't make sense to either of you. No, that's no, Irish I thing. don't know that one. <laughs> um, I, I don't know what you call it. It's, it is, uh, what does it do? Closet, maybe? Is that hmm? a thing? A linen closet? Is that a thing in yeah. America? Where you it's, put it's towels like, and sheets? Yeah. 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 And it's like yeah. a separate room. It's like, yep. it's mm-hmm. inside. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, that's the hot press in Irish. Um, <gasps> you learned something. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so yeah, that's my room. Cause I just have the, the mic nestles in amongst all the towels and stuff. And I just lurch over it, but it's whatever works right in there. So I have to use my phone. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm sure you get good sound editing from all the towels and sheets. Yeah, no, it really, really works. So uh, there yeah. you go. I uh, actually originally used the closet. So same idea. There you go. There you go. Hey, if it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's what I always Exactly. <laughs> um, Work with what you got. Now, this one I know the answer to, and we actually didn't allude to it. Um, what are your goals now that have nothing to do with writing and reading? Um because I do know you made a particular decision as a couple there a f- month or two ago? <laughs> two months yeah, ago. Two, two months, months ago. ago. Yeah. 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 Uh, survive a wedding planning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yay. Yay. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. We got engaged a couple months ago. Wedding End is next April. year. Yeah. And we actually have one other goal that is not writing related. We are training to climb the highest mountain in the contiguous United States. Oh, cool. Mount okay. Albert. It's 14,400 feet. Wow. Okay. And that's yeah. Which is for reference, that's only 9,000 feet higher than we are now. <laughs> okay. So it's, 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 well, that's still pretty high though. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it's cool. the tallest of the 14 years. 14ers? For, 14 in years? 14ers. <laughs> the, it, yeah, it's the tallest mountain outside of Alaska in the okay. U.S. Wow, that's, that's really It's about bad. two hours from where we live. Okay, that's good. Cool. And we'll have and, to start the hike at like four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, it's wow. nine wow. hours. That's a lot of walking. <laughs> yeah, uphill the whole way. Well, I... <laughs> 
well, I figured it would be uphill. <laughs> yeah, like I had twigged that. Um, but I'm it, from a part of Ireland that is all mountain and hills. Like my my house is on a mountain. Like it's it's quite oh, high cool. Up. Um, the house I grew up in that is, and my boyfriend isn't. He's from he's from. So we were all, we're all told as kids that Ireland is shaped like a, a saucer or a plate. So oh, all yeah. around the coast it's all mountainous, <clears throat> and then the middle is all flatland. So right. he, the first time we walked from the town I would have gone to school in to my house, which is only a two mile walk, but it's all uphill and all quite <laughs> steep as well. He couldn't handle it. <laughs> he only really ever gone like flat horizontal directions. And I was just like, oh, yeah. Man, look at this. Uh, when I moved out here, I moved here from Louisiana, which okay, is yeah, at yeah. sea level yeah. and dead flat. It's a yeah. floodplain. And for the first about two months I was living here, I would get lightheaded in the shower. <laughs> like, it was awful. Oh, when I came out to visit for the first time, climbing stairs. Like, crazy. make sure you're holding on to the handrail. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. So we're inviting you and your boyfriend. <laughs> I'll Come on be out. fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll Are be you fine. sure? We'll take you we are the, the mile uh, high city. We'll take you up to Loveland Pass. That's about 16. No, it's what is that? 11,000 feet? I don't remember. It, it's never high. not snowing. It's never <laughs> not snowing. We went up at the end of May. Yep. Okay. And drove into a snowstorm. Oh, wow. Okay, like, so that's high. <laughs> like yeah. 40 mile an hour winds and we about, were in the cloud. <laughs> about 50 feet visibility on the road. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like so much fun. <laughs> it, was. it was awesome. Actually, and the last it, time we went up before that was in October. And the wind was blowing so hard it would push you. Oh god. You could jump straight up and land six feet ahead of yourself. <laughs> it was that bad. It was like 60 or 70 mile an hour winds. It was hilarious. <laughs> There's um this is not near the same but you just reminded me of something when i was a kid so the, the my primary school was built on a hill because i'm from leitrim so everything is built on a hill um but the the playground at the back uh the yard we would have called it um it, it couldn't be on a hill so what they did was like the, the bit that was close to the school was on ground level but then as you went out to the very edge of it it was actually there was a sheer drop so they had okay a, it was like terraced yeah yeah exactly okay and on a on a particular windy day because there was no fence going around this and it was it was like a, to us it was this huge drop but it really wasn't it was like two meters at the highest yeah. you know not much so what we would do we would get our jackets hold them up like you keep them on your sleeves oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Hold them pull up, like up. This. And yeah. then run and jump off the edge and then <laughs> back onto the edge. same kind of thing yeah, yeah, except yeah. to a fully grown man, to a 180 pound man. Yeah, this yeah, yeah, was yeah, doing yeah. that. So yeah, that's quite, that's quite dangerous too. Um, it was terrifying, but it was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. All the good things are. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. So, uh, last two questions are very easy. Um, we'll go with, I know, right? Yeah, two more. It doesn't matter. Uh, Nick, what? Uh, where can everyone find um, <clears throat> you, particular online? And then, so I'll get you to say where they can find you online, and then where you can find everything, all the together stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you can find me on Twitter at NJ underscore Sullivan, S-U-L-L-I-V-A-N. Ugh. Do you need the cheat sheet? <laughs> no, he no I need to stop stuttering. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so Twitter NJ underscore Sullivan, S-U-L-L-I-V-A-N. You hear how much better that comes out when I don't have myself in my ears? Um, on Instagram at 66 underground, that's the number 66 underground. Uh, I still have a TikTok, but I've kind of uh, semi-officially ret retired from TikTok. Uh, yeah, there was some issues there, so yeah. I'm not really posting there much anymore. In fact, I haven't posted there in like a week, I don't think, which is a lifetime in TikTok. Years. I was about to say, that's a yeah. really long time. TikTok, it just um, flies through. And that's me personally. That's where you can find me. Cool. Uh, so, Lucia, where can we find you? Uh, oh, 
you're muted. Now you're both muted again. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> it helps when you're not muted to tell people where you are. It does. Um, <laughs> On Twitter, I am at Celosia Crane, uh, C-E-L-O-S-I-A, and Crane like the bird. And on Instagram, I am the exotic ant, uh, the underscore exotic underscore ant. Uh, my brother gave me that title, which is better than the title my sisters gave me, which was the queen of inappropriate footwear. Um, <laughs> I earned that one. <laughs> it's so true, too. It's so true. And then on Facebook at Celosia Crane Author. Awesome. Perfect stuff. And then all the, I, I'm pretty sure all the podcasts can be found on all the directories, but I know yes. you have yes. a website that they're all found at. We have a website that is our merch store. Merch store. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Which is lanternaudioworks.com. We also have, who was that? That was somebody something the from Windows popping up. There's on my three computer. computers here. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have Lantern Audio Works on Twitter, which is lantern underscore aw. Cool. And just today, we launched a Lantern Audio Works Facebook page, oh, awesome. which is at Lantern Audio Works. So, and we also have Instagram. Oh, yeah which is the same as the Twitter. And we have See, this a is, Patreon. This is why I wrote notes. I was going to say, you said... <laughs> <laughs> so There's like, we can't there so them. much stuff. Um, we also have a Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash Lantern Audio Works. Brilliant. We're just for, for what it's worth, for anyone who's listening or watching, trying to take them down, please don't forget that all the links people talk about will always be in the show notes and always be on the blog post. So it'll all be there. And so Rosie, I'm and gonna borrow that cheat sheet from you. Uh, we're gonna. I was gonna say <laughs> we'll send we'll you. email you. <laughs> Please, just the full list. <laughs> um, and guys, my very final question, then we'll leave it there. Is what was the last book you both read? Ladies first. Well, I've been reading a book called Ridiculous. <laughs> so it's a humorous take on. Uh, so this, she's a stand-up comedian and uh, television writer and her reflections on her wedding planning and how ridiculous big wedding industry is. So <laughs> I appreciate her sarcasm. <laughs> and then uh, Nick, uh, what was the last book you read? Uh, currently, I actually have it right in front of me. I, have, I am reading Make Noise, A Creator's Guide to Podcasting and Great Audio Storytelling. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <clears throat> most of my fiction reading is, uh, by the way, this is a great book. If anybody's interested in it, the guy works for national public radio oh, here, in, wow. here in the U S right. and podcast producer. And he works with audible now doing their in-house development stuff. And he's just got, it's not a lot of technical information, but it's more like interviewing information and finding a stable voice for your podcast and what do you want to do? What format do you want to use? Like that kind of stuff. Quick, quick question. Is there a chapter there on interviewing two people at the same time that have never been interviewed before? Actually, I think that's a little that, too where that oh. mark, where, where the uh, bookmark is, is the chapter on interviewing. I haven't gotten all the way through it yet, but if you need a chapter on that, I feel like I could write it at this point. <laughs> <laughs> We're a trial by fire. We definitely are. Um, uh, it's a, it was a fire, but it was a, a an enjoyable one, so I'm not too worried. Yeah. Um, guys, this has been, I mean, yeah, it's yeah, been. yeah, it's been, it's definitely it's been, been. <laughs> chaotic and fun and very. Uh, it's great to get to know both of you a little bit better as well. You too, kind of you too, interacting with you a lot on TikTok and Twitter and all that kind of a thing. So, and um, thank you so much. Did we mention the YouTube channel? Oh, we have a YouTube channel too. <laughs> So we'll make sure and get you all those links. All yeah. those links will be there, folks. It's fine. Yeah. It's fine. It's fine. I was like, yeah, we have YouTube. Oh, shit. We didn't say YouTube. <laughs> but it was really nice to get to talk to you. And thank yeah. you for having us. Yeah.